Thank you <clears throat> very much, uh, Darren. I'm glad to be at Baylor University, and I know many of you are too. Uh, it's a great joy for me to be able to introduce uh, to you tonight our speaker, not least because I've been hearing about her for a long before I began to read her because my wife is a rabid fan. Kathleen Norris <clears throat> is a person of enormous range of talent. She's got a lot of interesting things going on in her mind. And in her searching, spiritually discerning masterpiece, Asedia and Me, she holds conversation with a number of the most acute intellects in the history of Christian letters. One of the most lucid voices is that of Soren Kierkegaard. <clears throat> Our speaker for this evening confesses early in this book what many a less honest writer might not. Namely, that whilst Soren Kierkegaard appealed very much to her undergraduate ruminations on what she calls life's quotidian mysteries, she did not at that early stage of her life understand Kierkegaard all that well. Those who have read and reread The Great Dane over many years can sympathize. Admire and be grateful for his shrewd insights as we may, the profundity as well as rich complexity of Kierkegaard's thought reveals itself to most of us slowly in increments of understanding over decades of reading him against the backdrop of other voices, <clears throat> other interventions in life's great conversation. This, it seems to me, is likely to be true also of Kathleen Norris. Her own work, as it surely will also continue to be read and reread. A Cloister Walk is undeniably attractive to readers 20 or 30 years of age, but its appeal will acquire different and deeper dimensions as life's burdens shift and the sense of what counts as ultimately worthy matures. Norris is a writer of accomplishment in many genres. Seven books of poetry, several nonfiction volumes, which might be classified as spiritual autobiography or as treatises on Christian wisdom, not to mention a rich panoply of lectures and interviews. Any number of these works, such as Dakota, a spiritual geography, and her DV, D, uh, and th this is a modern thing. I am used to writing with a quill pen almost. She has a DVD, and this DVD is entitled Embracing a Life of Meaning, Kathleen Norris on Discovering what matters. Those things have not only attracted to her a devoted following amongst our contemporaries of all ages, but have won her awards and national literary acclaim. In all of these works, she shows what she means when she says, therapy is not the purpose of religion. And adapting the poet Mallarmé insists that faith does not conform itself to ideology, but to experience. To this she adds, in such terms as I think Kierkegaard would approve, that for the Christian, this means the experience of the person of Jesus Christ is what is central, not someone who once lived in Galilee simply, but as she says, now lives in all believers. We note not merely that Kierkegaard frequently appears in, her own, in, in his own words in her writing. She quotes them all the time. But one hears Kierkegaard's accents in her narrative voice and recognizes her willingness to call things by their proper names as part of their authentic kinship. She has a kind of Kierkegaardian edge sometimes, it seems to me, in her prose. One more point of praise, <clears throat> in which she is both Kierkegaardian and more than that. If I may quote again from Amazing Grace, in the suspicious atmosphere of the contemporary Christian church, it is good to know one's ground. When others label me and try to exclude me as too conservative or too liberal, as too feminist or not feminist enough, as too intellectual or not intellectually rigorous, as too Catholic to be a Presbyterian or too Presbyterian to be a Catholic, I refuse to be shaken from the fold. It's my God too, my Bible, my church, my faith, it chose me, but it does not make me chosen in a way that would exclude others. I hope it makes me eager to recognize the good and the holy wherever I encounter it. <clears throat> that passage is a great passage in an our lamentably polarized, often pharisaical times. It seems to me that this is a confession worthy of celebration by us all. 
In a meditation on heaven, <clears throat> our distinguished guest recounts a dream in which she is seated at a celestial banquet table, and, and she recognizes there Emily Dickinson, and I'm quoting, seated next to Saint Therese uh, of Lisieux, and Soren Kierkegaard seated across from them. And she says in this meditation, I long to hear their conversation. As do we, Miss Norris, at our more mundane banquet tables, long to hear you reflect on your conversation with the philosopher whose work has drawn us all together this weekend. So, false pretenses, my teenage crush on Soren Kierkegaard and trying on faith for size, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our guests. I'm still floating on that Kierkegaardian edge. Uh, he, uh, that is just such a wonderful thing to hear. I'd be the last to know if it's really true, but I want to believe that it's true and uh, that somebody else found it in my work. Uh, so thank you so much for that, for that introduction and thank you to everyone at the Institute for Faith and Learning to that, who brought me here uh, to Baylor. Um, it's uh, it such an honor. I must admit I laughed out loud when I got the invitation. Uh, just because um, um, I'm not much of a philosopher but, or, or even a Kierkegaard scholar, but I just thought this is a wonderful uh, invitation. I think this, this will be really great, so thank you. Um, there are two things I want to start with. Uh, I, will, I want to begin with a poem, but also I wanted to mention something. When I was looking over the programs, including one that I missed, I noticed that someone was talking about the film Blue Jasmine, in, in terms of Soren Kierkegaard. And that really struck me because when I saw the movie um, earlier this year, that was like the first reaction I had. I'm not sure quite why I reacted that way, but I said, oh, Soren Kierkegaard should really be seeing this. Um, <laughs> in a sense, and I'm, I'm try I was trying to figure it out today. It's partly because it shows what happens when someone actually tries to live on the surface, only superficially and really never becomes a self. And for some reason, I remember being really struck by that. So um, I was happy to see someone mentioning that movie. Well, because I am a poet, I want to begin with a poem as a kind of an invocation for my talk. It's called A Prayer to Eve. Mother of fictions and of irony, help us to laugh. Mother of science and the critical method, Keep us humble. Muse of listeners, hope of interpreters, inspire us to act. Bless our metaphors that we might eat them. Help us to know, Eve, the one thing we must do. Come with us, muse of exile, mother of the road. Well, I'm honored to be here, deeply honored, but I must admit that I was a little baffled to be invited to this particular party. I am no expert on the subject of Soren Kierkegaard, but only a fan. I haven't read all of his works and wouldn't even now claim to have a thorough understanding of much that I have read. So even though the sponsors of this conference made it clear that they were opening it to people who are not Kierkegaard specialists, I feel that I have to offer you two caveats as I begin my talk. First of all, I am not a trained theologian. The last formal class that I took on the subject of religion was a required course at Punahou School in Honolulu when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> I still have one paper that I wrote for that class, a cheeky reflection on what I grandly termed the affair between David and Bathsheba. And secondly, I am no philosopher. My best friend from Punahou actually teaches philosophy at Notre Dame, so I have access to pretty good philosophy. Um, but I'm much happier making connections between disparate things than trying to make distinctions between them. I'm not sure that I even believe in dialectical opposition. I like to think that all things meet eventually, even if we can't always perceive how or where. And stories tend to stay in my head much 
more than ideas. Once after I had spent several months with a group of scholars at the Collegeville Institute at St. John's in Minnesota, a professor of philosophy became exasperated with me during a conversation. He said, all you do is tell stories. I immediately responded in all earnestness with what is probably the worst thing you can say to a philosopher, well, what else is there? <laughs> I did once try to study philosophy as a young woman at Bennington College, one of the most secular environments in America. I sought out both literature and philosophy in the hope that they would nurture my spiritual life. And it worked up to a point, but philosophy was and is a struggle for me. For example, at one class at Bennington had me reading an entire book by Immanuel Kant, and I probably even wrote a paper on it. But now, all I know is that Kant had one very big idea that had a significant influence on Western culture, but for the life of me, I can't recall what it was. <laughs> I could have Googled it, I could have Googled, you and Googled it and impressed you, but I didn't. Someone may want to fill me in later, and that would be fine with me, but I still might forget all about it in a week or two. <laughs> I continued taking philosophy classes at Bennington until I wrote a paper on the philosophy of William Blake, who of course was a mystic poet who saw angels in the trees of London's Hyde Park. My professor kindly suggested that I turn my full attention to literature. <laughs> so I was basically kicked out of the philosophy department at Bennington. And in the world of philosophical scholarship, I suspect that this is about as low as you can go. So perhaps already in, in some of what I've said, you might have an inkling of what first attracted me to Soren Kierkegaard if some of his Socratic thought twisting made my head spin and still does, I found in him a poetic creativity and a sense of humor that greatly appealed to me. I really did develop a teenage crush on him. For the record, I also liked Chuck Berry, Bob Dylan, and the Beatles. <laughs> but my infatuation with Kierkegaard began when I was about 15. I was browsing in a bookstore and still remember a yellow paperback entitled fear and trembling, and the sickness unto death. I ask you, what teenage girl could resist that? <laughs> well, this one couldn't. And when I, when I bought the book and began reading, I found Kierkegaard addressing subjects I was desperate to know more about, even if I was too, a little too young to really understand much about him, his world, or his writing. It amuses me now to try to imagine what he would have made of this overly cerebral, precocious, and passionate girl I was then. Most likely he would have run for the hills or maybe the Danish seacoast. As a fledgling writer, I was attracted to Kierkegaard's language, the power of his writing. Although I'd never say that I understand the full meaning of the teleological suspension of the ethical, I always did like the sound of it. <laughs> It has what poets call a good mouth feel, the teleological suspension of the ethical. <laughs> and I'm grateful to Kierkegaard for really, for introducing me to the word eschatology. In my book, Amazing Grace, I write that I was a scholarship student in an expensive school, a fish out of water with little grasp of the complex culture of Hawaii where my family had recently moved. Shark bait was common slang for pale skinned bookish kids like me. I took up Kierkegaard in self-defense, finding a kindred spirit in the prickly Dane. For similar reasons, I also embraced Emily Dickinson and these two 19th century eccentrics and becoming my friends plunged me into the world of eschatology. Later, I discovered that the motto of the Norris family crest that my father found in England is regard the end. So maybe eschatology is in my blood. Or maybe it has to do with my constitutional inability to do things right at the outset. The first time I was asked to preach to Presbyterians, I spoke about the communion of saints. The first time I addressed a gathering of Unitarians, I spoke about sin. <laughs> Often it is by doing things all wrong the first time that I make them come out right in the end. I have the feeling that Soren Kierkegaard might understand that. 
And of course, I had come to Kierkegaard all wrong, backwards, as it were, plunging into his writing really long before I was ready for it. The bite of Kierkegaard's sarcasm was accessible to me and also attractive to a lonely teenager needing to feel superior to the high school jocks who called her a dog. I admired also his scorn for Christians who had become too complacent in their faith, rendering it lifeless. But above all, I loved the boldness of his claim to both a poetic and a philosophical license. His calling fear and trembling a dialectical lyric, for example. I treasured the boldness of his proclamations. Doubt is thought's despair. Despair is personality's doubts, even if I had difficulty following the lengthy expositions that followed. When I was in high school, my family attended a very liberal United Church of Christ whose adult classes were taught by the, literature by the religion faculty of the University of Hawaii. And it was there that I was introduced to the biblical interpretation of Rudolf Bultmann. And I didn't like, really much like all that demythologizing. On my own, I discovered and took refuge in Evelyn Underhill's masterful book, Mysticism. And I also latched on to Kierkegaard and what I think of as his re-mythologizing of religion. The first thing I read by him was Fear and Trembling, and I was hooked absolutely delighted at the way he could discuss Abraham and Isaac and suddenly introduce a merman in love with a young woman and even admit that he can understand the merman whereas he cannot understand Abraham. This spoke to me. This was my kind of thing. <laughs> the, the freedom to do that as a writer. And to do some re-mythologizing of my own, I'll add that everyone should know this. It is the archangel, Raphael, who makes sure that we find the people in our lives that we most need to find. And I believe the same is true for the writers we need. I needed Soren Kierkegaard when I was too young for him because I, did, I needed to hear what he had to say about boredom, despair, and trying to form a self to become an individual. I mean, that's a very adolescent concern, but his way of looking at that was quite liberating for me. And I was also, at that age, becoming something of a specialist in unrequited love, so I appreciated his own story in that regard. <laughs> Above all, I admired Kierkegaard's ability to cut like a laser through the superficial. It thrilled me to read that, this is quote, to be unaware of being defined as spirit is precisely what despair is. That I may have had the fleshy football players and cheerleaders in mind as I read this matters far less than discovering Kierkegaard's in deep insight that deep within the most secret hiding place of happiness, there dwells also anxiety, which is despair. In a metaphor that helped me, as an adolescent and still instructs me when I am faced with the onset of a despondency whose causes are not easy for me to discern, Kierkegaard summons up a fairy, or more accurately, a troll tale, comparing despair to the troll who disappears through a crevice no one can see. So it is with despair, he writes, the more spiritual it is, the more urgent it is to dwell in an externalized world behind which no one would ordinarily think to look for it. Soren Kierkegaard helped me to understand what I had trouble expressing even to my loving and understanding parents, a bent towards melancholy, moments of dread when suddenly my everyday world seemed super thin, a mere tissue that covered a great abyss. But the question remains, why Kierkegaard, that sly and most exacting of thinkers, for a teenager with a spotty understanding of Christian tradition and a constitutional incapacity for philosophical rigor? Trying to cope with his dazzling array of categories, his almost atomized language, made my struggles with algebra seem easy. Well, to put it in Kierkegaardian terms, I gave up on algebra, or it gave up on me. But I persisted with the Dane because it was both absurd and necessary to do so. I felt a deep personal affinity with him that I could neither explain nor deny. 
If Soren Kierkegaard was an unlikely companion for a dreamy adolescent girl in 1960s Honolulu, he was also a kindred soul. I connected deeply with Kierkegaard's sense of harboring a hidden self that he felt would never be accepted or understood by his peers. He could conceal his melancholy by applying his wit and what he termed his gift of dialectical clarity, while I relied on the synthetic powers of metaphor and poetry. But the results were similar, a divided self which could appear to be one person on the page and quite another in the world. From childhood on, I had frequently encountered what Kierkegaard describes as the sadness of having understood something true and then of only seeing oneself misunderstood. And of course, most adolescents feel this. They feel lonely and misunderstood at one time or another. But when one's otherness is repeatedly borne out in experience, it helps to have someone like Kierkegaard on your side. I would not have expressed this as starkly as Kierkegaard writing of the curse of ne to never to be allowed to let anyone inwardly and deeply join themselves to me. But I was beginning to sense at that age that my life would not unfold like that of my schoolmates, that childbearing was out of the question and marriage unlikely. And in that wonderful talk on James today, uh, the book of uh, the letter of James, I was thinking about that, that my, my, my marriage, which lasted 25 years until my husband died, that really was that shocking good and perfect gift that came out of nowhere, that came from above. Uh, that was a, the biggest shock of my life and a wonderful one. Of course, as a teenager, I was no doubt misreading Kierkegaard much of the time. When I was asked to come up with a quotation that would go under my senior photo in the school yearbook, I used this. When a man dares declare, I am eternity's free citizen, necessity cannot imprison him except in voluntary confinement. I mean, other kids were quoting the Beach Boys. Um, <laughs> there is, a, I think there's a Coleridge quote on my page. I looked at that page recently. There's a, someone quoting Coleridge. We had some good quotes, but mine, I think, was the best. <laughs> but what can I tell you? It sounded good to me at 17. It seemed to point to the airy intellectual freedom I aspired to. The significance of that voluntary confinement escaped me, as did the grit of Kierkegaard's insight that true freedom develops out of discipline and a healthy respect for necessity. I was just a bratty kid who didn't want to make her bed. Why bother, I would ask my mother. I'll just have to unmake it again at night. To me, the act was a meaningless repetition. To my mother, it meant offering hospitality to oneself. You will feel better, she said, if you come home to an orderly room. This was an ongoing argument. And of course, my mother was right. But I wouldn't realize that for many years when I could see my adolescent self more truly. Beneath that tough facade of a free and creative spirit, I was fearful. I was afraid to make my bed because having to do it again tomorrow might only make me sad. I was afraid to risk committing myself to relationships because they might ask too much of me. When I took up Kierkegaard and clung to him for dear life, I was searching for a way to understand what I could not yet name. A personal confrontation with Asidia, what the early Christian monks called the noonday demon. It's good to know that even in my adolescent fog, I was looking in the right place, for Kierkegaard was a Protestant with an appreciation of early Christian theology as a taproot that might still provide good nourishment. In an 1839 journal entry, he wrote that he appreciated the deep knowledge of human nature that had led those early Christian monks to include the dreadful mixture of acedia, melancholy, and restlessness I mean, of aridity, melancholy, and restlessness called acedia among the seven deadly sins. Although the monks, God bless them, did not use the word sin, more accurately, they referred to these inner temptations as bad thoughts or passions. Two other books that I, by Kierkegaard that I treasured as a teenager in a haphazard process of browsing and picking up whatever interested me was repetition, and purity of heart is to will one thing. 
The latter resonated deeply with me. Even as a child, I often felt like an observer standing outside myself. The scholar Mary Louise Bringle notes that while Kierkegaard knew the Latin root of the word despair as that which is opposed to hope, his native vocabulary would have offered another perspective, a Danish, Danish words reflecting a sense that despair can also arise from the fundamental doubleness of the human spirit. Peter Kramer, in his book Against Depression, notes that Kierkegaard delineates an element of melancholy that has had special meaning ever since. The alienated consciousness, always aware of its distance from authenticity, immediacy, and single-mindedness. And on to repetition, and one of the jokes for me about repetition is that I feel the need to read it over and over, to keep repeating it. And of course, the fear and scorn of repetition is at the heart of acedia. And that book by Kierkegaard really helped me to embrace repetition as a blessing rather than a curse. Repetition is reality, he writes. It is the seriousness of life, the daily bread which satisfies with benediction. Children have a lot to teach us in this regard. I'll never forget the first time I read Peter Rabbit to my oldest niece. She very solemnly and in a very, um, she really commanded me to read it again. And imagine this, a small child who finds a penny on the floor of a post office and then keeps moving the penny to several locations, proclaiming each time, look, I found a new one. <laughs> that story is not in Kierkegaard. It's something I once observed a little girl doing, but I think it's one he might have enjoyed. I mentioned Emily Dickinson earlier as the other companion of my crazy adolescence. To give you some idea, I actually went on one date in high school, AP English class. A AP, AP courses were new in 1965. And a boy from my class, that we had no romantic interest in each other, but he, we liked each other. And he called me up and invited me on a date. This was the only time this happened, all four years of high school. And our date consisted of going to uh, the University of Hawaii to a production of Jean Anouilly's Antigone. I had a really strange adolescence, but <laughs> again, I think Kierkegaard would understand that too. Um, so she and Kierkegaard were contemporaries. He was 17 when she was born. She was 25 and not yet a recluse when he died. They were both haunted by death and also by the sense that there is something eternal in the self and they were questing for that, I think, all their lives. I have long fantasized about what they would have to say to each other had they met. They both perceived Christian faith as a dynamic force. Emily Dickinson wrote, on subjects of which we know nothing, we both believe and disbelieve a hundred times an hour, which keeps believing nimble. I believe she would have resonated with Kierkegaard's statement that faith means that what I am seeing is not here, and for that very reason, I believe it. Faith signifies the deep, strong, blessed restlessness that believes so that he cannot settle down at rest in this world. A believer cannot sit still. A believer travels forward in faith. Both Soren Kierkegaard and Emily Dickinson found that their own interior travels drove them very far from shore, far from the safe harbor of conformity. Amidst the evangelical fervor at Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, Emily Dickinson, and this was, she was still a teenager, but she sometimes found herself the only one in chapel resisting the call to declare oneself for Christ. She contended with others and with herself on this issue, experiencing, it was really the first time, I think, in her life uh, that she experienced her otherness in a way that could not be denied. Um, she was still very sociable, uh, like Kierkegaard. She actually was sociable, if admired for her wit, got along very well with other people in her early, as, you know, as a young woman. But uh, I think she experienced at an early age the truth of Kierkegaard's observation that the majority of people are not so afraid of holding a wrong opinion as they are of holding an opinion alone. She did stand alone in that situation more than once. And she wrote to a friend, 
You are growing wiser than I am and nipping in the bud fancies which I let blossom, perchance to bear no fruit, or if plucked, I may find it bitter. The shore is safer, Abaya, but I love to buffet the sea. I can count the bitter wrecks here in these pleasant waters and hear the murmuring winds, but oh, I love the danger. Late in his life, when he felt called to public condemnation of the state church, Kierkegaard wrote in his journal that he was venturing far out into the unknown and commented that, as usual with me, I have got my orders only once I am on the deep and that the plan is I should go a bit further than I had envisioned. Both of them regularly committed idiosyncratic and dauntingly imaginative acts of biblical interpretation. They're a lot more fun than those stern Germans. <laughs> I believe that Kierkegaard would have appreciated Dickinson's uh, consider the lilies is the only commandment I ever obeyed. <laughs> That, that actually sent me to writing a whole poem. That is a commandment, and if you look at the Gospels, there's a lot of those little hidden commandments in there. Consider the lilies is the only commandment I ever obeyed. And I suspect that she would have delighted in his observation that God was remarkably foolish to allow the incarnation of Jesus Christ to occur before the invention of the printing press. I don't know what she would have made out of Kierkegaard's reflecting that God created Adam out of boredom and Eve came about because Adam was bored and then humanity followed so that we could all be bored en masse. <laughs> but I'm fairly certain that she would have liked it and also that he would have been astonished and probably moved by her observation. And again, this is in a, a letter. You know there is no account of her death in the Bible and why am I not Eve? That particular line actually inspired the poem I read earlier. You know, there is no account of her death in the Bible, and why am I not Eve? No doubt Emily Dickinson would have delighted in Kierkegaard's observation that Christ was crucified in the Apostles' scourge if only at Golgotha there had been a professor of theology at hand. <laughs> Given Dickinson's conviction that this world is not conclusion and that we, the nature of faith is to elude much gesture from the pulpit, I suspect that she would gl have gladly agreed with Kierkegaard that the essential sermon is one's own life. Both Soren Kierkegaard and Emily Dickinson developed a fine sense of the dissonance between a lived Christian faith and the complacent world of official Christendom, and they could be very hard on preachers. After a sermon by a renowned pastor who was visiting Amherst, and for years Emily Dickinson did go to church. Her, her reclusive period actually came fairly late. After the sermon, uh, she returned home and she wrote a letter, in a letter, what confusion would cover the innocent Jesus to meet so enabled a man? Kierkegaard's advice to shun preachers is exactly what Emily Dickinson did in her later years. And I believe that she would have had a keen appreciation of Kierkegaard's insight that Sunday vistas into eternity are nothing but air. It is in the living room that the battle must be fought. Not only in her poems, but in her letters, we find ample evidence that Dickinson did fight fierce eternity internal battles on the domestic front. For each of them, the development of a self and the recognition of their difference from their peers eventually called them to retreat from normal social intercourse. In 1848, when he was 35, Kierkegaard resolved to turn from traveling and seeking external stimulation. I must remain in the spot, he wrote, and be renewed inwardly. Emily Dickinson became a master at that, having reached a similar conclusion in 1867 at the age of 37. While well, adolescence is a time when we try on things for size, we imagine lives for ourselves, we begin to question the religious faith that's been handed to us and try to form something that is our own faith, we begin to discern our vocations. Both Emily Dickinson and Soren Kierkegaard gave me a sense of what might be possible for me as a writer and as a Christian. I might need to appreciate faith as a way of life and not of doctrine. 
uh, a way of singing and not of catechesis. I mean, when I was a little kid, I really assumed, my, partly because my father was a choir director, and I just assumed we went to church in order to sing. And now I'm back to that. I think that's really it. Um, that's a good reason. And, and I started, I didn't really lose faith or anything, but I started getting really bored with church when we had to memorize things in catechism. I said, that's not, you know, what's this about? And we had a wonderful pastor. This was the Congregational Church in Illinois. And I was, he's a lovely man and everything. I really liked him, but I thought, oh man, let's just get back to singing some hymns. It was just uh, all of that. To get at the truth, I might need to use some fictive voices. I might need to tell that truth slant. Boy, both Emily Dickinson and Kierkegaard are expert at telling the truth and telling it slant. They both also taught me to temper, in some ways, my facile infatuation with them. As a teenager, it was easy to laugh over Kierkegaard's remark that most people are only really sample copies. It took me a long time to recognize that this applied to me. <laughs> unless I was willing to do the difficult work of becoming an individual. And I think it's important for us to remember in our overwhelmingly narcissistic culture that Kierkegaard's individual was firmly rooted in a community. Having an individual who has formed himself as an individual in order to contribute to society and make it better than just a mob. Well, I sometimes return to Kierkegaard's journal simply to savor the beauty of the writing. And I'd like to close my portion tonight by reading what I consider to be one of the most beautiful passages I've ever found in literature. It's from a journal entry he made in 1835 when he was visiting the Danish seacoast, far from the comforts of home and his accustomed society. Um, he was quite sociable, kind of life of the party at that age. The soul selects its own society, Dickinson wrote, and I believe that Kierkegaard in his life and writing demonstrates that very clearly. Here in the journal, he begins by evoking the creation story in Genesis. I stood there one quiet evening as the sea struck up its song with deep and calm solemnity, and the sea set bounds to the heavens and the heavens to the sea. As I stood there without that feeling of dejection and despondence, which makes me look upon myself as the enclitic of the men who usually surround me, and without that feeling of pride, which makes me into the formative principle of a small circle. As I stood there alone and forsaken, and the power of the sea and the battle of the elements reminded me of my own nothingness, and on the other hand, the sure flight of the birds recalled the words spoken by Christ, not a sparrow shall fall to the ground without your father. Then all at once did I feel how great and small I was. Then did those two mighty forces, pride and humility, happily unite in friendship. Lucky is the man to whom that is possible at every moment of his life in whose breast those two factors have not only come to an agreement, but have joined hands and been wedded. For he has found that Archimedean point from which he could lift the whole world. Well, thank you. And I believe we are going to have a question and answer session, and my, my philosophy of that is I entertain questions but can't promise to answer them. Oh, okay. Okay. yeah, I think it's, it's just easier for people. It's such a simple question. I don't know anything about Emily Dickens. Where should I start? Um, actually, I would start with the letters and then go to the poems. And there are three volumes. Har Harvard University Press did a volume of three letters, and there's lots of wonderful notes. Um, and, um, and then also Richard Sewell's biography, which, I mean, there have been biographies written since, but his is, in a way, the most thorough. 
uh, he really covers, and there's wonderful references. That his references are just marvelous. You can think of a line from her poetry, and, and there might be a, a way to find it in, in the biography. And then, and then go to the poems. I think, um, I mean, the poems are, are great, but, uh, but I would start with the letters. OK. OK. Yeah, you're welcome. There's a one volume, Selected Letters, too, that, that's also very good, also from Harvard. The same. It would give you the same notes and things. Say a bit about that image uh, that you imagine in heaven. Why is Teresa there with Jesus? Oh, um, and that really was a dream. It was, you know, I don't always dream in such spectacular ways, but that was really a fun one. Um, well, it's partly because Therese, I think, had some similarities with Emily Dickinson in the sense of feel, you know, having this. Um, um, a big ego, but also a, a littleness to them. And um, they both struggled very heavily with doubt. Therese, in the very last year of her life, you know, had this radiant, she, all her life she had a very radiant faith, a very easy faith. And all of a sudden, in the year before she died, she lost it all. It was, she wouldn't, I don't know if she would say she lost her faith, but she entered this period of great deep despair and darkness. And, it, and I think this is what, to me, this is one of the reasons she really became a saint was in her struggles, one of the most incredible prayers she made was she asked God to uh, allow her to, to you know, uh, she would accept the suffering from God as long as he would open heaven for unbelievers. I mean, that's just amazing. And here's someone dying of tuberculosis. It's not an easy death, and she's only like 26 years old or something. But I, please, God, I will endure this if you will only open heaven for unbelievers. And so I just think there's an ambiguity and there's things there that, um, with Emily Dickinson and Therese, that uh, they had a lot in common um, in terms of doubt, ambiguity, a number of, of things like that, uh, sort of the patron saint of doubt, in a sense. And I just think Kierkegaard would enjoy both of them, so. You know, women he could talk to. or listen to. Hi. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, part of your title was your teenage crush on Kierkegaard. Part of it was trying on Faith Versailles. Could you give us the story of the second part? Yeah, I didn't really go into that as much, but I think um, with both, the, both Emily Dickinson and Kierkegaard, realizing that doubt was an essential part of faith and struggling with that was okay. Um, because usually, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're going to church and you're playing dodgeball with the youth league and you're doing all these things, doubt is not necessarily the, the biggest subject that comes up, but it might be really deep in your heart. And so I think both, with both of them in, uh, in particular, and I really, you know, here I was reading, you know, Fear and Trembling, but I really didn't have a way to talk about it with other people. Like, what, are, what do you say to the minister or the other kids? I'm reading this book about Abraham and Isaac. Yuck. You know, I mean, it was kind of hard. So, I mean, I was um, kind of struggling with a lot of that on my own. Um, and I think that really is a time when you begin, you know, uh, the church of your childhood, the faith of your childhood really has to change and it has to become your own. And that's, um, that does happen in your, in your teenage years. So I sort of adopted, I might have even adopted a Kierkegaardian faith at that point. I'm not sure how I would define that. But that helped me, his, his view of Abraham and Isaac, his looking um, at things like despair through a biblical lens. I mean, the references to the Bible and stuff were really kind of what helped me uh, during that period, realizing it's possible to explore this in different ways than I'm seeing around me. Does that help? Okay, yeah, thanks. When you were talking about uh, your teenage experience, I kept thinking about my daughter who becomes a teenager um, next week. Any we'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> Any suggestions? She's a quirky um, girl who loves writing and reading. Any reading suggestions? Not fear and trembling and sickness <laughs> unto death. Um, but um, I think letting somebody explore uh, where they want to explore, and actually reading things that are just a little beyond them, so they may have to look up the words in the dictionary that they don't understand, 
is, is a good idea. Fiction at this age is probably just as good as, as anything else. I mean, that, that exploring through fiction is a really good way to, um, to do things because when you're reading, uh, I remember talking to a, a professor at St. John's, a monk who was actually working with novices. He said, we had, the, they found a great, uh, uh, they found a novel, but they also were Peter Brown's marvelous book on Augustine which covers the issue of celibacy. And he said, we're, we're, we're using it to, with the novices to talk about celibacy, both this novel and the Peter Brown book, because they can discuss the book and they don't realize they're really talking about themselves. And I think that's one of the powers of fiction for young people, too, is that you can explore it, and you're also exploring yourself at the same time, but it's in a safe, in a safe way. Um, and just whatever her interests are. I mean, if she's interested in science, there's Lewis Thomas, you know, the biologist. There's beautiful writing. Uh, if she's interested in writing, uh, uh, Zinzer, is it Howard or Harold Zinzer? A book on writing well. It's a marvelous book on the subject of writing. Um, you know, whatever her interests happen to be. If it's truck driving, you know, probably get her a subscription to a trucker's magazine. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> um, um, but it's a wonderful age to explore. And if she's interested in reading, that's just, that's wonderful. And also maybe some of the, find out what she's reading in school and find books that are very different from that. That, that was my, our, my oldest niece endeared herself to me at my husband when she turned about 15 or 16. She said, what I want for you for Christmas is books, novels and books that I'm not likely to read in school. Oh, what did that warm our hearts. And so we, I mean, I still do that. I still will send her novels and, um, you know, but that just wanting to explore more and more. Uh, I taught an undergraduate seminar on Kierkegaard for a number of years, and one of the things that I always insisted on with the students is if they really were going to really fully understand and appreciate Kierkegaard as an author, they needed to take the pseudonym seriously as personae with their own perspectives, et cetera. Now, your story indicates that testament to the fact that it's possible to be edified by Kierkegaard's writings without doing that. Uh, but I'm wondering if in, in the course of your engagement with Kierkegaard, you ever became interested in the pseudonym as personae, and if so, how that, if, if that happened, how that affected your, your reading and your uh, appreciation? Of it's not so, I really haven't studied that very much, and I, for some reason as a, as a kid, it, it didn't uh, really interest me that much. I guess I was curious about why he felt the need to do it and didn't know if that came from inside him or the social pressures from the outside and I've always wondered about that but it's just nothing that I have really studied that much and of course at that age I hadn't read John Climacus. I've read The Ladder of Divine Ascent now so I know who John Climacus was. Um, at that point I, um, that came 15-20 years later after I'd started, you know, first started reading Kierkegaard so it would be interesting to go back and sort of see and of course the names amused me I mean they're funny but um, of course his sense of humor too I mean Kierkegaard just laugh out loud funny it's just, you know, and, and a lot of people kind of miss that about him, the, the melancholy Dane. Well, that's there, but that wonderful wit and sense of humor is there, too. It's just, just great. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about Kierkegaard's um, otherness, and this is a question that I've been thinking about since the plenary earlier, about him and how he broke off his engagement with his fiance. I haven't read a whole lot of Kierkegaard, but from the impression I've got from what I've read, he seems like perhaps one of these people that sort of cherishes this otherness and this kind of, oh, I'm a sufferer and I'm suffering, but I'm kind of cherishing it. So what do you think about maybe that him breaking off his engagement with her was kind of a subconscious, oh, I'm not going to be happy. I kind of my suffering in my lot, therefore I'm going to continue suffering. It's something he sort of maybe cherished and became one of those people that's like, oh, that's my lot, I'm going to accept it, and everything is going to be about suffering. I think there's a mixture of the two. I, I don't know that I would say he cherished it, but he accommodated it. He understood eventually that that's who it was. And my impression with the whole relationship was that it wasn't that he wouldn't be happy, but he would make her very unhappy that that was very much more a part of the decision was that he was not capable of giving her probably what she needed. 
and uh, the indication was she was in love with him. She was um, uh, uh, wanted to make him happy, but I think the main thing for him, and I, I saw a couple of people nodding, that, that basically he didn't think he could make her happy was the main reason there. And he probably was right about that. I mean, it's hard to speculate, but if you've ever read The Diary of a Seducer, it's not the kind of guy you'd want to marry. I mean, I know it's a fictional piece, but in fact, that to me is one of the most remarkable things I've ever read because he had the nerve to publish that in 18, the 1840s. And when I read it, I said, my God, this is a work of pornography without any sex in it because it's all about taking control and power over another person and then just abandoning them. And I mean, the reasons he wrote it and did that are very, very complex. I mean, he was trying to keep, get his fiance off the hook that everyone would know was his fault and not hers. And so socially, that was very important for him to do. Um, but that book just blows my mind. It still does. Um, it's just, and you wonder, you know, if, if um, I don't know if I'd want to marry him after reading that. <laughs> not sure. Is that, does that help at all? So do you think that kind of leans towards perhaps Mentality? Like that, that yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, I think he just thought, I, and again, this is real kind of crazy speculation, but I think he thought he had to accept the suffering because that was reality, that anything else was, trying, was deluding himself. And he was somebody who really, really tried hard not to delude himself. And so I think that was it, that he thought, no, I have to accept this because this is the real me. This is the, this is the situation I'm in, and I can't make it otherwise. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I think we can have one more. Okay, and there was a, somebody here. That, so you were here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the great talk. Thanks. Um, I had a follow-up question to the previous one. Um, fortunately, my daughter's only two, so. I have oh, a, that's a great uh, age. Uh, yeah. So um, I was wondering if you had an opinion, uh, especially from the perspective that you said that you know, adolescents, when they're, you know, through the teenage years, start to find their own way and uh, make decisions about what to do with what their parents gave to them. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts on a parent handing their children Kierkegaard at that kind of age. Or do you just leave it on your bookshelf, maybe pull it out? Right. Well, if they, if and, it's, uh, see if for a two-year-old, I would recommend getting a copy of Fear and Trembling, that's a bath book that they can dunk it and they can just sort of, you know, a plastic, a plastic book, or maybe, maybe a cloth book they can chew on, I mean, I, yeah, two years old, I mean, although I'll have to tell you, I mean, I was recently in Denver with my niece, who's almost three, but, um, it's amazing what kids perceive and how they see things. We're sitting at dinner one night and her mother says, well, how was preschool today? And Gabriella sighed and she said, well, I made some bad choices. <laughs> and went, she's three years old. And she said, well, she said, uh, there's a, she mentioned another little girl. The, these two girls are very good at making bad choices together, uh, partners in crime. She said, we were running inside the classroom. But it turns out that this is how their teacher describes it. And I think it's really great. It's very empowering because they understand it's a bad choice. And they know they, have the, they can make a decision to make a good choice. And we talked about this for a while and how running in the classroom is not a good idea. And was your teacher really upset? And, well, kind of. She told us. She made us sit down. And you know, that's really a punishment if you're two, to sit down <laughs> and be still. Then her mother said, well, you're going to make better choices tomorrow. And she said, no. So, you know. <laughs> But, um, but you know, it's interesting. I think we shortchange children. I mean, I used to use Wallace Stevens with second graders. Um, and teachers would say, well, I don't even understand this poem. I said, I don't either, but let's see what the two-year-olds can do with it. Like the, the, po the, the, the palm at the end of the mind. They loved that poem. They shut their eyes, and then they could write their own description of what was at the end of their minds. I mean, I think we do shortchange children um, in a way that we think they can't get anything out of someone, say, like Wallace Stevens. Kierkegaard might be something of a hard sell. I mean, even to a five-year-old. I mean, they're mystics at that age, but um, I'm not sure how much of Kierkegaard, although he, you know, he does tell parables. There's a little anthology, the parables of Kierkegaard, and if you were going to try something with children, uh, some of the stories in there, 
Someone just excerpted a whole bunch of things from his different, so maybe the parables of Kierkegaard, stick it on the shelf and see if she picks it up. And, and when she starts asking for the car keys, it's all over, but. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all these questions. It's been good.